23 years ago today, New York City, America, and the Western world was forever changed. Islamic fundamentalists hijacked four commuter jets and crashed them right into the heart and soul of our nation. Nearly 3,000 people were murdered that day. Their goal was to destroy our free world, and with that, our free way of life. But we didn't let them win. We realized how lucky we had it in America up until then. Americans only became more united. We expressed a patriotism and love for our nation that sadly seems to be missing today. But New York wouldn't have overcome like it did without a leader who has since been recognized as America's mayor. He is my friend and today's guest, Mayor Rudy Giuliani. Mayor, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, it is a great pleasure, always. Please walk us through your morning, the day of 9-11, when you first heard of the attacks unfolding. Well, it was a um, unusual day. It was a primary day in New York. I was at the end of eight years as mayor, two terms, and they were having a Republican and Democrat primary to select the candidates for mayor. So I thought it would be a little quieter day than usual until the late afternoon when they started you know, challenging each other. <laughs> so I put off my morning meeting and I had breakfast with a friend and with my counsel, Denny Young, and a uh, former assistant U.S. attorney of mine who was thinking of running for governor of California and actually did. But at the end of it, a police officer, Patty Verone, who was a detective, who, who was my part of my security detail, came in and said to me, there's a terrible fire down at the World Trade Center. And uh, they think, and Denny Young told me they thought it was a twin engine plane that had hit the, the tower. Well, we rushed out. We rushed down from the Peninsula Hotel, which is about 55th, or 55th Street, I think, and, and 5th. Then we rushed down to the World Trade Center. When we were about three minutes away, four minutes away, the second uh, plane hit. And the police commissioner called me. I had been in contact with him earlier. We were thinking that probably it was a terrorist attack and preparing for it. But we weren't sure. And then police commissioner called me and said, a second plane hit. This is definitely a, a terrorist attack. Well, we had closed down the bridges and the tunnels. We had dispatched our police officers to our security points, the places that we thought from prior intelligence that the terrorists would attack. And I went right to the scene to meet with the fire chief, uh, Chief Gansey. As I was approaching, I was looking up and debris was falling down. Then I realized I was looking at a man who jumped. And it was a terrible experience. Uh, probably didn't let myself feel it then. Isn't a day that goes by, I don't think about it. And I watched him come to the ground. And I grabbed Bernie's arm and I said, Bernie, this is uh, beyond anything we handled before. We're going to have to just use our best instincts. We're going to have to stay extremely calm. And we have to ask God to make our decisions right. And he said, you're right, boss. And then I went up to the chief and I asked him what he needed. And he told me. Uh, I asked him to confer with the police commissioner, make sure the police were given all the support they could. He urged me to make sure we move the people away from the World Trade Center because they were coming out, but they were standing there and looking at the fire. But they were in harm's way because things were coming down, debris and people. And uh, some people were getting hit by them. Uh, despite that, they were still mesmerized by the fire. Not everyone, but a certain number of people. A certain number of people walked away. A certain number of people ran away, but some people just stayed. He said, tell them to go north. That's the safest, safest thing is to go to Midtown and, and get as many people out of here as, as you can. This way we can get uh, the trucks through because we'll be here all night. I said, um, well, okay, we'll get a generator. I'll take care of all that with the commissioner. Um, we have, we, we've talked about some other details of the rescue. Um, and then we went back, we went to a police department command post. It was a small office, about two and a half blocks away. And while we were in there, 
the first building came down and we got trapped in there and we were trapped in there for about half hour. Uh, the governor, some people thought we were killed. Uh, took us a while to get out with the help of two janitors. We did. And when we got out, we weren't sure whether we should stay in the building or go outside because outside was terrible. People were getting hit with debris. Um, my choice was whether to stay inside with about 40 of the top officials of New York City government that I had with me at that point or go outside. And Bernie Carrick and I decided it was better to go outside. Um, and that way, maybe a few people would be killed, but not everyone. So that's how it all started. And then we got out and that was when I had my first um, interview and told people to go north, to get out of the way, to get out of there. When they got out of there, get out of the building as quickly as possible and walk north immediately. And don't, uh, don't uh, linger around. And we've got the best police department, the best fire department, We've got the best emergency people in the world. And this is a terrible, terrible attack. But if anybody can handle it, they can. So remain as calm as you can. And we'll be back to you as soon as we have more information, something like that. And then we look for another com uh, command post. I called the governor. And that's when the governor told me he thought I was dead. He said we were told that um, you and Bernie Carrick went into a building. And you didn't come out. And the building was hit. And I said, well, we were trapped in there for a while, but we did get out. And so uh, I didn't realize until later that night when I saw how the building came down that we escaped it, you know, very pretty narrowly. How do you even, how does a mayor or a police chief even wrap your head around such a devastating attack as it's happening? I, I know that you said in the moment you, you referenced in the moment you, you were in shock and then you just said you, you realized that night when you saw the TV footage, everything that happened. But how do you get the entire city together? How did you do what you did? How did you accomplish what you accomplished in that moment, knowing or not knowing whether you were going to live in any second? Well, we had planned for 20, 30 different kinds of emergencies. We had practiced, we had had them. We had had an airplane crash, we had had subway derailments, we had had terrorist attacks that we had to deal with in the past and stop. Uh, New York City is an emergency a week and a catastrophe a month. So probably as a mayor, I had more emergency management training than any mayor in the world. I also developed the first uh, mayor's office of emergency management because I was elected the year of the first attack on the World Trade Center. So I expected that we were going to have a terrorist attack. I, I didn't know we were going to have that kind of an attack, but we were prepared for it. We had, we had uh, foiled the terrorist in 1997, 98, as he was about to hit a toggle switch and blow up an entire building. Uh, the police and the FBI, with great work by a rookie police officer, got him just at the very point that he was going for the toggle switch and killed him. Um, we had had other terrorist attacks uh, that didn't that we thwarted. We had collected an enormous amount of intelligence on on Al Qaeda and on uh, and on Islamic extremist terrorists. The first attack had been planned in New Jersey in a mosque in New Jersey. We had infiltrated those mosques. Governor of New Jersey didn't even know about that. He didn't find out until years later. And Chris Christie got angry at poor Mike Bloomberg for it. And I called up Chris and I said, I did it. <laughs> I put the cops in there undercover in the mosque in New Jersey. He said, why wouldn't you rely on the New Jersey police? I don't rely on anybody to protect my city, but me and my people. Um, and he shut up. <laughs> um, so, so therefore, one of the first things we did is close down the bridges and tunnels because we said whatever amount of Islamic extremist terrorists we have, uh, we have on the island. We're not going to ignore it. Um, and I knew immediately it was bin Laden because he had threatened 
declared war on us. He had, we had some of his people on trial a few blocks away. I had closed down uh, the area around the federal courthouse, the ready around the city buildings. Uh, we had had to put additional security into City Hall at the request of the FBI, actually. Um, I had the advantage of the director of the FBI, Louis Free, was an assistant U.S. attorney when I was the United States attorney. We were very close. And he had become a federal judge and then head of the FBI. Uh, so I think we probably had a closer relationship with the FBI than anybody. And also, I had worked very closely with the FBI as U.S. attorney. All my cases were with the FBI. So I, I think we had additional information that you wouldn't normally have about what was going to happen. We expected a terrorist attack. We did not expect an attack by airplanes being used as missiles attacking our buildings. That was the wrinkle to it. And what I found, uh, Justine, is that the preparations for all the other kinds of attacks, anthrag, uh, um, just uh, sarin gas, uh, other kinds of bombings, prepared us for that. It was uh, uh, an order of magnitude or more worse, but it was the same kinds of things that you had to organize. I was very fortunate. I, I, I told uh, everyone when I would get honors or I was given an uh, honorary knighthood by the queen. And I don't mean to drop names, but, but I said to her, you know, th th I owe this to other heroes who, who, uh, who made me look good. I was on the, I was standing on the shoulder of giants, but she said, you were a hero yourself too. It was very kind. I've always loved Queen Elizabeth for that, but it's true. I mean, I had incredible people, uh, Whatever credit I get, all of it goes to them. You mentioned all of the precautions that you had in case, God forbid, a terrorist attack did happen. I wanted to fast forward to modern day, given what is happening at our border and even the Biden administration now admitting that he's allowed dozens of terrorist watch list illegals into our nation. There are people now flooding into this country who are on the terror watch list. Is it a question now if, if or when we have another 9-11? You know, uh, I, I uh, have been living with not, uh, September 11 now for 23, 23 years, right? And um, there's a period of time after it happened. I mean, you never, you never get over it. And as I said, I think of the man every day. And I also think of the flag being put up. It's like counter images to me. I think of the man, I wonder who he was and I wonder how he made the decision. I mean, all kinds of things going on in my head. And then immediately when I feel myself getting too down about that or other parts of September 11, think about those uh, mar uh, Marines, <laughs> firefighters who put up the American flag like the Marines at Iwo Jima. And I had just read this book, The Greatest Generation by Tom Brokaw. And it leaves you with a question. Do we have it? Do we have what the greatest generation have? Immediately seeing them, I said, you're damn right we have it. These are the sons and the daughters and the grandsons and the granddaughters of the people who won the biggest war in world history. And, uh, and we were the reason that war was won. And uh, a lot of families sacrificed tremendously for that. And all of a sudden, you see these guys. No one knew the danger they were in putting that flag up. Right below them is a fire of a thousand degrees Fahrenheit. They could have been sucked right into it. For about three weeks after the attack, the uh, way down, three, you would say like three stories, four stories, five, six stories into the ground, there were fires. I mean, not fires, like hell. A thousand, two thousand degrees Fahrenheit. The, essentially, when the when the buildings uh, uh, came down, they imploded, or as it was described to me by the uh, uh, experts, it melted. It melted from the from the uh, uh, gasoline, the jet fuel, that burned, and that's why it took a while. It was seeping down. Well, the question you asked me is one that is uh, I hate to answer, 
because there was a period of time I thought things had gotten safer. Uh, I thought President Bush's response was magnificent. Uh, he did exactly what Clinton never did. I mean, Clinton got got banged by bin Laden and gosh, we had an American uh, naval vessel attacked. And our response was to bomb an empty field. You might as well invite it. I mean, I, these people don't learn any lessons from like the Second World War, the First World War, the Cold War. Uh, b- basically, we were telling bin Laden we we're a bunch of sissy. Yeah, we don't fight back. One of the things I said to Bernie Carrick right, right, as we were escaping the second, the first building or second, second building to come down was thank God that Al Gore is not the president. Because I said, well, we had that guy there. We had another empty field. Well, Bush went back and uh, uh, immediately, almost immediately, right? He took, he took them, uh, Al Qaeda and Ben Lani, and he stuck them in mountain hovels and they didn't get out. I mean, Ben Laden got killed years later, but he basically was he was stuck in a hole in a mountain. And if he moved, he was going to going to get blown up, and just about everybody around him was done away with. So that kept us safe. And our early efforts at uh, intelligence were ter- were terrific. Um, Trump did a great job. I mean, he actually got control of the border. Well, to give you a comparison, the border was down to about four hundred thousand plus. In the last year that Trump was in office, uh, last year under Biden and Harris, it was 3.5 million that we know about. Think of all the people that come in that we don't know about. And the b- basic theory is, and nobody likes to tell you this anymore, you get about one for one. So if you count one, one probably you never saw, you came in 10 miles away on the border. That's a big border. And the cartels have much more control of it than the feckless Biden-Harris administration. Uh, so all you got to do is listen to uh, the director of the FBI, who I think is pretty useless, but he's right about this. He, he tells you that the danger is much greater than before September 11th. And th- there's a reason for that. So in the last three and a half years, since Biden opened the border completely, we've had uh, upwards of 10 million illegal aliens come in. Uh, we vetted very, very cursory way, if at all, about 6 million of them. The others we've never even seen. How many of them are terrorists? Who the hell knows? But if the terrorists aren't using that as an opportunity uh, to send people in here, they're not terrorists. Or if the, uh, look at what China's doing. China's sending in spies by the dozen. You know, we asked the chi- Chinese illegal uh, aliens only four questions. I don't know what we could ask them. <laughs> are you Chinese? Do you want to hurt America? Are you a nice person? And are you going to hurt anybody? Yes, yes, no, no. And they come in. I mean, I, we, we don't want to delay the illegal Chinese aliens from getting in. Four questions. That's why uh, the director of the FBI every two weeks tells us we better get ready for an attack. And he's right. Uh, you had a, t- a terrible uh, situation in Canada just well, September 4th, I think it was. They arrested a um, Islamic extremist terrorist who had plans to blow up a Jewish center, actually to attack it with guns uh, on October 7th. He was originally planning to do um, uh, uh, an attack on a uh, uh, he thought maybe a memorial celebration for October 7. And in the affidavit, which I've looked at very carefully, I, I did so many of these, I can probably tell you most of the things they left out. <laughs> like, I, I think I know the center. Um, he was planning on doing it in another city. It doesn't reveal the city. But he couldn't get specifics on what kind of celebration, or not, I'm sorry, memorial they were going to have. And uh, so then he decided, he heard about this Jewish center. Somehow he got uh, some of the details of the interior. So he had a, uh, had people recruited. He had a plan to get in. He was collecting arms. And uh, he was going to come in on October 7, and they would have some kind of ceremony there that day. 
You could kill everybody at the ceremony. He said that'll and and in his, in what you can see in the affidavit and and he was doing a lot of debating with his fellow Islamic terrorists as to whether this would be big enough. He was a little disappointed that he couldn't do something as big as an attack on a on a on a memorial celebration. So, so everybody should read this affidavit. It tells you this is alive. It's well. Uh, we have a lot of criticism of the FBI, and they're correct, and they got to be fixed at the high level. But this was a magnificent work by the FBI. This is something we should, I mean, if we're going to criticize them, we got to praise them. Not many countries would have been able to do, do that. And they um, patiently let this guy spill his guts to them. I can tell from the affidavit, it's about a 40-page affidavit. Uh, they probably have about 1,000 pages. And, but uh, Christopher Ray has warned us over and over again that the threat is the worst that it's ever been, and it's incalculable. For the reason I told you, we don't know who's here. We never always knew. We, we, we never knew everybody who was here. But we had a pretty good hold on it. When 400,000 people are coming in, or even 800,000, you can have some, some kind of hold on it. The director of, of uh, Homeland Security for Barack Obama thought a million a year was the uh, break point. In other words, that's where we, we might as well just forget the security. You're going to let a lot of people in that are going to hurt you. Um, so think about it. He let 3.5 million in that we know about. We've got a lot to worry about. And um, hopefully we get a much more law and order oriented administration in Washington. Very, very, I mean, the sooner the better. That being said, we discussed foreign invaders, people who we, we don't even know how many people are in this country. But now we have another issue. We have young people, our own Americans, people who are part of members of my generation now cheering on Hamas in our streets. They're cheering on ISIS. They cheered on October 7th. You were with me at Columbia University when we saw these young students so brainwashed. They've been taught to hate America and to want to destroy this country from within. And it seems to be a stark difference from the reaction of young people after 9-11. Suddenly, we have almost two generations since people who, like, like myself, I was turning three on 9-11. And all of a sudden, people my age, it seems because they were so young during that period, they don't really understand how lucky and safe they are. So it seems to have been so easy to just brainwash them to support the very people who conducted those attacks. So how do we go from there? And God forbid, if 9-11 happens again, how can we bring the country together? Are people going to just be cheering in the streets for that? I don't know. I mean, if, if we were to be attacked now, I, I would think a certain portion of those young people would blame us for supporting Israel. When in fact Israel is uh, going through what we went through, uh, you could you could look at uh, October seven as a f uh, a kind of September eleven, uh, kind of it was a September eleven. It was a terrorist attack on innocent people uh, by a t a terrorists who raped and murdered and murdered people. So um, how this gets all turned around, I do know how. That I can answer. I mean that's a that that's a Marxist plan that's been executed over 30 to 40 years of turning a lot of our professors, making them Marxists, training them in China. Gosh, you can look at the Democrat president, uh, can, uh, vice presidential candidate. And he seems like someone that was uh, a Marxist teacher. He went to China 30 years ago on, a, on uh, funding by Harvard. He was trained in China. He went to China 30 times after that. Taught, paid by a Red Chinese University. If he taught in China, he had to teach what the Chinese told him to teach or he wouldn't be alive. So uh, I have no idea why we let this guy just kind of try to waltz into the vice presidency. Went to China for 30 years, brought students there and taught there. And says that so, one man's socialism is another man's uh, neighborliness. That's straight out of Karl Marx propaganda. 
uh, Walls is, you know, one of many that have brainwashed our children for a long, long time, or it appears that way in the case of Walls, but there are plenty of them. Mayor, thank you so much for joining <laughs> us. It was so great speaking with you. Thank you. For and, yeah, we'll be, we'll be back. Yes. We want to see you. <laughs> Take care. Just Take care. God bless. God bless. Thank <laughs> you.